Thank you. I am so excited to finally be here at AppJS um, this year. So I'm really excited to give you the talk that I was meant to give last year. Thankfully, my topic is timeless. So I'll be talking about building a five-star app. In particular, I'm going to talk about why app reviews are important and what us as engineers, what we can do to nudge our app reviews in the right direction. So just a quick intro. Hi, my name is Caddy Kraman. As Yanni said, I'm currently the uh, Director of Engineering for Mobile Services at Formidable. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter uh, if you want to connect um, under Caddy Kraman. That's usually my handle. So I built a bunch of mobile applications, and I'm excited to share some of my experiences. So when me and my sister were little, my, our parents had this rule that we don't get any treats throughout the week. We have a treat day on Friday. So on Friday, we can tell our dad anything we want from the shop, any ice cream, any chocolate, any candy, anything we want. So no treats and just that one day of being treated. And that was a very difficult decision in my life. And little did I know, that decision was one of the simplest that I'll be making. As adults, we continue to make more and more decisions each day. And every single decision has more and more options. So what shoes to buy, which conference to attend, where to book a holiday, what house to get, which job to accept. And due to globalization, due to capitalism, we have more and more options for every single choice that we make. And arguably, that is a good thing. We're spoiled for choice. But really, we are exhausted by all these choices. There's been a lot of studies on this, and uh, various researchers have found that an average adult makes around 35,000 more or less conscious decisions every single day. And this is causing a thing um, called decision fatigue, which you might have heard of. And it's the idea that the more decisions you make, the worse you are at making those decisions. And there's various things to combat this. For example, something you might have heard of was um, a bunch of well-known people who have a lot of responsibilities wear the same outfit every single day. And the reason they do this is to take the choice of what to wear out of their day so their decision-making fuel could be used on more important decisions, such as running a country. And this brings us to reviews. So reviews are something that we as humans have created to help us make these decisions in a world that has increasingly more and more options for every single choice that we have to make. So online reviews are almost as old as the internet. So the internet became mainstream in the 1990s. And the first online reviews actually appeared in 1999 in eBay, eOpinions, and a couple of other platforms. Originally, reviews were product reviews. They were about product reviews and seller reviews. And over time, you could review companies, then companies could reply to reviews. And honestly, these days, every single transaction, even, even if they don't involve money, um, will have reviews attached to it. They're just part of our life. Now, let me just give you some numbers. So from what I found, 72% of potential customers have said that they won't commit to a purchase without reading the reviews. And this one was quite surprising to me. 91% of millennials, millennials being people born in the 80s or 90s, so a lot of us in the room, uh, say that they trust online reviews as at least as much as reviews from friends and family. Consumers tend to read between four and 10 reviews like when forming their initial impression. And about half of them say that they are influenced more by companies that have a high number of reviews, not just the review itself. So if you have a 4.9 rating, say, but only 10 reviews, that means less than if you had a 4.8 rating and 10,000 reviews. All this is to say is that reviews matter, app reviews matter. So when the user opens this App Store page with your app, this is their first impression that they're going to get. And even if they dis so if, if you're in an industry that has a lot of competition, like e-commerce, uh, this might be a decision um, on the customer whether or not to download your app in the first place. And even if they download it, this is going to predispose their opinions when they actually use your app. 
Now, all of us React Native developers, uh, we are in this interesting position of working with both the App Store and the Play Store. And as with almost everything, we find that reviews are same, same, but different. So I'll just tell you how they work on the two platforms. So this was taken from 1,000 average, 1,000 uh, apps from iOS and from the Play Store. And it found that on the App Store, an average app actually had a rating of 4.5, with an average of 450 reviews. On the Play Store, the average rating was lower, with only 4.0, with an average of 2,500 two uh, Google Play reviews. So from this, we see that there are more Android users overall than iOS, which, which is true. And also, on average, Android users have a worse experience and or tend to be more critical. How the rating is calculated is actually also different. So on the App Store, believe it or not, it is more straightforward. It is literally a mathematical average of all of the ratings your app has re received in its lifetime. So they add it all together and divide it by the number of reviews. On a Play Store, they're actually weighted. So more weight is given to ratings on the last app version. This means that if you published an app version which, which um, fixes a bunch of bugs, you receive an influx of five-star reviews, your app rating will actually go up faster than the mathematical average would suggest. And the converse is also true. So this is why you see your Play Store rating fluctuate a lot more than your App Store rating. And finally, on the App Store, you have a unique feature of being able to reset your rating. So if you've ever published an iOS app, you probably would have seen it. It's part of the uh, publish flow. And it's just a radio button that, al that allows you to either keep your existing rating, which is the default, or reset it. Uh, it's useful to know that it doesn't actually reset the reviews. The reviews will still be there and visible. However, they don't count against the number displayed to the user. On the Play Store, this is not supported at all, because they do the weighted average. Now that we're halfway through, let's talk about how to actually build a five-star app. Now, when I started this talk, I had about 10 bullet points here. But over time, I've toned them down to just two most important things. First, we want to preempt common complaints. I'll be honest, originally, I named this Build a Good App. Uh, but I thought that was a little bit um, difficult to action, so I'm trying to be more specific. And I'm just going to outline the things that users care about the most uh, when it comes to reviews. The first thing is app crashes and ANRs. So for me and my team, any kind of interaction that prevents the user from using the app, completing their flow, that is priority number one. So if you haven't already, I would 100% recommend setting up an error boundary um, in, your, in, your React, uh, in your React Native app. So an error boundary basically uh, does it so that if you wrap it around your app, any JavaScript exception thrown inside the error boundary, rather than opening the alert, the ugly alert with the JavaScript error and crashing the app, it will allow you to catch it and then give a user a much friendlier error and also a way to progress. For example, just reload the app. Secondly, you want to communicate errors to the user. I know that there's always going to be a default of, oh, something went wrong. However, whenever possible, users want to know what happened, what can they do about it, and who to contact. And the other thing uh, that's very, very important for us, at least, is if you are publishing to any um, large group of users, if you have like a million users that have downloaded your app, you'll want to track your errors and you want to monitor them. For example, I usually use Sentry for this. So in Sentry, you can, uh, you can track your um, app errors. You can track errors introduced in newer versions. So when you do stage releases, so you start off with maybe just 10% of users, you would you would track the errors in Sentry, and you see if there is an influx of an error that never happened before, but was introduced in a new version, in which case you could hold your release, go and fix it, and fewer users will be impacted. Secondly, as developers, I think we're all aware just how expensive it is to test. So unit testing is expensive in terms of time, effort, 
maintenance, 100% of unit test coverage isn't really feasible for most people or projects. So we need to prioritize. And if there is one area in your app that you should prioritize for unit test coverage and regression testing before releases, it should be anything to do with payments. Um, as soon as money gets involved, people get more frustrated, more angry much quickly. So this could be making a purchase within the app, but also if your app unlocks any paid content. So if you take the user's money, you really need to make sure that the experience that they paid for is available to them. Now, before we go on to the last bit, I want us to all to internalize this point. App reviews are not just a reflection of your app, but of the whole user experience. I think as developers, because we're the ones building the app, we're the ones publishing it, we're often the ones monitoring the reviews and the crashes, then we are the ones held responsible for the app rating. But the truth is, for most applications, the app rating uh, the actual app experience is only part of what goes into the rating. And the user doesn't care that the app is good, but the things outside of the app weren't. They are rating the whole experience, including the company. So just to give you a few examples, so you have two types of negative reviews. You have reviews that could be in your control. So for example, um, if there's a feature that's not working, um, for example, if there are crashes or errors, or if there is some UX problems, for example, a user can't find a way to search. So let's say there's no way to search products in the app, and actually there is a search, but you put it in a, in a place that the user can't find it. And then you have the frustrating ones, the types of negative reviews that are just outside of your control. So for example, your payment provider goes down. There's nothing you can do about it. You're angry at your payment provider, but the customers don't know that. They are just angry at you. Or if you're building an app that, uh, where you're selling products which get delivered to the user, uh, a, very common error, uh, a very common negative review is the delivery driver um, was late, uh, my product was broken, uh, the product had bad quality, um, product was delivered to the neighbor. And this is not something that you can fix as a developer, but it will affect your App Store review. And finally, there's always going to be anti-company sentiments. So public sentiment of the company might drive individual opinions, and nowadays people would um, potentially go to the App Stores and leave you a review to reflect that. So if we just do some quick matches to give you an idea of what the impact of these one-star reviews is, uh, just to take a mathematical average of an app that got one one-star rating and one five-star rating. So our average is now three stars. So we want to get this up to four point something. So I've done a quick formula here, and I've sorted by x, and just plugged in some numbers so you can have a look. So at the very minimum, we want to get a 4.5 star rating. So given that we have one one-star rating, we would need seven five-star ratings to offset this so we could get to our target of 4.5. And this gets exponentially harder the closer to five stars we want to get. So if our goal is a 4.9 rating, which really is considered a good rating on iOS, then we need 39 five-star reviews to offset that single one-star review. Now have a think. How many times have you personally looked up an app on the App Store or on the Play Store to give it a good review? If it's more than once, you're probably better, a better person than me. And most of us don't. So human nature is so that we don't notice things when they're good. The good is the baseline. That's the expected experience. We notice things when they are absolutely ex exceptional and if they are even slightly worse than the baseline. And unfortunately, our threshold for complaining is much lower than our threshold for saying good things. So for example, the hotel that I'm staying at, I think it's decent. It's not the best hotel I've ever stayed at, but I don't really have any complaints. I'll be honest with you, I am not going to go to Google. I am not going to give them a five-star review just because I'm not that kind of person. However, if as I was leaving the hotel, there was a person there with an iPad that said, hey, do you want to rate your experience out of five? 
I'd give them five stars. Why not? I have nothing to complain about. And it was easy. And this is exactly the mentality you're going to have to tap into when it comes to getting those five-star reviews for your app. So how to ask for reviews. This is the point of the talk. First, you want to ask when the user is in a good mood. You know your app the best. Um, you know what flow is the good flow in your app. But just to give you some examples, if it's a shopping app, maybe it's when they've made a purchase. If it's a running app, maybe it's when they've completed a run. If it's an app for social media, maybe it's after they've browsed it for 10 minutes and liked a post, something like that. And then you don't give the native alert straight away. You use a custom prompt that you design yourself as small as and as inattrusive as possible just to go, hey, are you in a five-star mood? Are you enjoying this app? So you're kind of trying to prime the user and see if they're in a good mood. And if, if they're not, if you misjudge the flow, they'll go, nah, not really. And this gives you an opportunity to, get, to ask the user for an alternate, an alternate way to ask the user for feedback. And this is good in, in two ways. The obvious one is that you are driving the negative reviews away from your store page. But the important one, really, is that it gives the user a more detailed way to give you feedback about what's wrong, other than, I don't like the app, which is not actionable. And finally, when they say they love it, this and only this is when you open your native alert. And hopefully, they'll hit that five star, and um, you're getting that much closer to your five star app. So in summary, the average rating um, on app, and app Store and Play Store are, on the App Store, it's 4.5. On the Play Store, it's about 4. So a good rating on the App Store is around 4.8, 4.9. And on the Play Store, you should be aiming for at least 4.6, 4.7. So your goal is different. And you shouldn't be worried if your, apps, if your Play Store rating is lower than your App Store rating. Secondly, some feedback is always going to be out of your control. Don't worry about it. It's not a reflection on yourself personally. It's just going to happen. However, it is important to proactively uh, counter this, offset this. And the way you do this is you proactively ask for reviews. You ask for reviews when your user is in a good mood. They've just done a positive thing in your app. Ideally, it's the main thing your app does. You show a non-native prompt just to check if your user is in that five-star mood. If they're not, you give a detailed uh, form for them to provide additional feedback if they're in the mood. And if they say, yes, we like your app, you show the native prompt, and you get your review. I hope you find it useful. That's all for me.